So we started here last time. Uh, we're talking about the forces between molecules. Uh, it would help if I go back to it. Okay, the next one then we're going to look at after dipole dipole uh, will be the dispersion forces. Sometimes known as London dispersion or just dispersion. London dispersion forces mainly exist between nonpolar molecules. So it's mainly between nonpolar molecules. Guys, all molecules have London dispersion forces. Okay, these fit for every type of molecule. But when you're looking at a molecule that's nonpolar, this is the only thing it's going to have, is dispersion forces. So how do you have dispersion forces? What you have is something called an instantaneous dipole. What do you think that means, instantaneous dipole? Right. It happens really fast, and it's only for an instant. Okay? It's not a permanent dipole. And um, how this happens is, I can't really show it. You're going to have to envision it in real time. Um, but if you have a molecule, and you all know that we envision electrons as rotating around the nucleus, right? Now. Are electrons always going to circle the nucleus all balanced out? Probably not. It's kind of like a washing machine. You know, you put it in there balanced, and then something happens, and the thing gets all out of whack, right, while the cycle's running. Same thing can happen with a molecule. So you can have electrons that are balanced going around a nucleus, and then at some point in the life of this molecule, the electrons get imbalanced, and so there's more electrons on one side than on the other. What's that going to do? That's going to cause that molecule to have an instantaneous dipole because the side where there's more electrons is going to have a negative charge, and the other side is going to have a positive charge. Now, electrons are going to keep moving, and that thing's going to balance back out. Okay, It's not going to stay out of whack, but what happens is when one molecule gets imbalanced, if it's close to another one, it throws the other one off a little bit. So it's kind of like a chain reaction. So that's why London dispersion forces, we say it's instantaneous dipoles, and it's a chain reaction amongst different molecules. It's, very, it's temporary, okay? London dispersion forces are really weak because you've got two things that are nonpolar. What kind of attraction do they have for each other? Not a very great attraction, but they can be attracted to each other. For example, oxygen is O2. And you guys know that at room temperature, oxygen is a gas, right? Wouldn't that tell us that the forces that hold two oxygen molecules together are extremely weak for it to be a gas at room temperature as opposed to, say, water? Do you know what the Lewis structure for O2 looks like? Can you real quick, like, think through that in your head? Mm -hmm. three bonds, it's three. Two. It's double bond because oxygen, each oxygen would have six valence, right? So a total of 12 have to show up in my structure. <coughs> <coughs> so that's what a molecule of oxygen would look like. I can tell by looking at that it's a nonpolar molecule. There's no dipole for me to draw on that molecule. And so it would have London dispersion forces. Oxygen molecules would not, I'm going to flip slides for a second, would not have dipole-dipole because it has to be polar to be dipole-dipole. London dispersion, I mean, oxygen would only have London dispersion. So when we're going through the three different types, whether it's dipole-dipole, dispersion forces, or hydrogen bonding, I said this last time, but I'll remind you guys again. 
you can have a molecule that has all three of those, okay? Every molecule has at least one, right? Because everything's got dispersion. But which combination you have, it's going to depend on what the molecule is. If you look in your books, there's a figure that shows dipoles changing. It's on page uh, 499 in your book. I'll try to put the table up here for those of you who don't have a book yet, but it's table 12.2. Table 12.2 lists fluorine, chlorine, bromine, and iodine. Can you guys go ahead? Okay, I'm sorry. I know this is kind of going back to the other day, but on the dipole, dipole, the arrow, the, like that uh -huh. arrow that you draw, what is it? Can you say what that is? Yes, again? yes. Sorry, no, that's, I'll, that's fine. I, that's fine if y'all stop me when you don't get something. The arrow shows electronegativity. Okay. Tell me the trend. What's the electronegativity? Oh, we're talking about this arrow right here, okay? How did I know to draw that arrow? arrow electronegativity arrows go on bonds, right? They always point towards the more electronegative atom. How do I know which atom is more electronegative? Periodic table. My trend is... Electronegativity increases bottom to top and left to right. That's my trend for electronegativity. So, yes, top right is the most electronegative. And then I always ask this twit, twit question when we're doing electronegativity in Chem 1. And I don't have the periodic table yet. I'm, I'm going to order it today. What's the most electronegative element? You're going to have to look at a periodic table to... Fluorine. How come it's not helium? Y'all know where fluorine is on the periodic table without looking? Yeah? You know where helium is? If electron... Helium... Yes. Yes. If we look at a periodic table, fluorine's right here. Helium's right here. If electronegativity increases bottom to top and left to right, how come helium is not the most electronegative? Because it's noble gas, and noble gases don't bond with anything, right? It's got to be fluorine. Noble gases don't react. So fluorine's the most electronegative element. Is that good? Yes, sir. Y'all remember all that? Okay. So if we look at these halogens, these are all halogens, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine. Are those polar or nonpolar? How do you know they're nonpolar? It's two of the same, right? Those are all nonpolar. So that means, are we good at that? If I say there's two of the same atoms, they're all nonpolar. Um, could these molecules, could this I2 and another I2 have dipole dipole interactions? No, because dipole dipole interactions are between polar molecules. An I2 and an I2, there's dispersion forces between them. A bromine and a bromine, there's dispersion forces between them. Chlorine, chlorine, dispersion. Fluorine, fluorine, dispersion, etc. If I had a mixture of all four of these, it's just dispersion. Are y'all with me on that concept? Okay. When we get the periodic table in here, I hate that I have to keep saying when that comes, uh, it's like the one that's in the lab. Y'all, it's color-coded. And if you remember from Chem 1, the, the black stuff means it's a solid, and the reds are gases, and the blues are liquids, okay? So what you will find when you look at these on the periodic table is that at room temperature conditions, in this room right now, fluorine would be a gas, chlorine would be a gas, bromine on that periodic table is going to be blue, it's a liquid, and iodine is actually a solid at room temperature. Okay, so even though fluorine molecules only have dispersion forces amongst them, the same being said for each one of these, it's just dispersion, would you agree with me that there's obviously different degrees of dispersion forces? There's something causing iodine to have stronger dispersion than fluorine. 
How do I know that? Because iodine's a solid at room temperature, but fluorine's a gas. So that tells me these things don't want to condense or solidify. They want to stay in the gas phase. And what's actually even cooler about iodine, yeah, it's a solid at room temperature, but y'all, solid iodine will sublimate. Do y'all know what that means? You do. What is sublimate? Sublimation. Somebody, I interrupted somebody. <coughs> it's, it's beyond melting because melting is solid to liquid. Sublimate is solid to gas. Iodine sublimates. If you open a bottle of I2, the solid will just, you'll see I2 vapors, which are yellow colored vapors, and it'll just sublimate, like dry ice. Dry ice sublimates. Remember talking about that in Chem 1? Okay, so we can see just by looking at the phases of these under the same conditions that there are different degrees of dispersion forces. How would I know, if I hadn't told you that this is a solid versus a gas, how could you compare different degrees of dispersion forces? Do you know anything about molar masses of these? I've written them in the order they show up on the periodic table, but you've got a periodic table in the front cover of your book. What can you tell me about the molar masses of these things? They're increasing as they go down. Yes. <laughs> exactly. The molar mass increases as I move down this list. Molar mass increases as I go down. Can you now <clears throat> say anything? Could you make maybe a guesstimate about how molar mass relates to dispersion force? Yes. Higher the molar mass, the stronger the dispersion forces. The higher the molar mass, the stronger the dispersion forces. Now, I should say, you've got to be comparing similar molecules, okay? Because if you were comparing molecules that were not alike, uh, say if I took fluorine F2, which has a molar mass of what? It's like 38 point something, according to the mass on the periodic table, and compare it to, I don't know, potassium nitrate. Fluorine and potassium nitrate do not have similar properties at all. Okay, potassium nitrate is an ionic solid, for starters. So you, do you see what I'm saying? You've got to be comparing molecules that are in the same class, the same family. You can't just blanket compare anything and say, oh, higher molar mass, higher boiling point. Okay, it doesn't work that way. The table in your book, table 12.2, it lists the boiling points of these in terms of degrees Celsius. And the fluorine has a boiling point of negative 188. The chlorine's negative 34. Bromine is 59 degrees Celsius, and iodine is 184. You don't memorize those, but do you see that when I was getting y'all to look at gases, <coughs> liquids, solids, and that characteristic, that I could do the same kind of thought process and think through by looking at boiling points and looking at actual quantitative numbers? Okay, do y'all see the relationship there? What is the BPT? Second? Boiling point. <laughs> boiling point. So what did y'all just write in your notes? Didn't you write higher molar mass? What? Stronger dispersion. Okay. What else could you write? Higher boiling point. Higher boiling point. Okay. Stronger dispersion increases the boiling point. Okay. That would be the same thing you could say. Let's talk about our next type of uh, Van der Waals force, which is what? Hydrogen bonding. And I pointed this out last time, I'll point it out again. Even though it says hydrogen bonding, it's not a bonding, okay? It's still an intermolecular attraction. Guess what you have to have in order for a molecule to have hydrogen bonding? Hydrogen. A hydrogen. Wow, that's not anything spectacular. Yeah, you got to have a hydrogen. So this is a force between a hydrogen 
and it's not just any hydrogen. The hydrogen must be bonded to nitrogen, oxygen, or fluorine. Okay, so the hydrogen has to be bonded in the molecule, has to be bonded to N, O, or F. Why N, O, or F? Look at where N, O, and F are. They're right up there on the periodic table. They're the most electronegative <laughs> elements, right? And that's why. It's the hydrogen that is bonded to a very electronegative element, specifically nitrogen, oxygen, or fluorine. Okay, their electronegativity is going to contribute to hydrogen bonding. So it's a force between a hydrogen and a lone pair of electrons. So in order to know if a molecule has hydrogen bonding, you're still going to have to be able to draw the molecule because you're going to have to know when I sketch the molecule out, what's the hydrogen bonded to. Just because there's an N, an O, or an F in the molecule doesn't mean that's what the hydrogen's on, right? It could be on the carbon. And if the hydrogen's on the carbon, it can't have hydrogen bonding. You're going to have to be able to draw the Lewis structure because you've got to know where the lone pairs are or if there are lone pairs. You know, sometimes you draw molecules and there's no lone pairs left. Okay, so you wouldn't have hydrogen bonding. Um, water. Do y'all know what a water molecule Lewis structure looks like? That one you should be able just to draw... You know geometry, et cetera. Really quick, right? Go ahead. Yep. O in the middle. Hydrogen on each side. <clears throat> and lone pairs on the oxygen. And we know that water is a molecule that takes on a bent shape. Right? Would this water molecule be able to hydrogen bond with another water molecule? Yes. It has to have these two things. Does it have a hydrogen bonded to an N, O, or F? Yes. Does it have a lone pair of electrons? Yes. So water molecules can hydrogen bond to each other. Of the three types of forces we're going over, dipole, dispersion, hydrogen bonding, Hydrogen bonding is the strongest of the three. Bless you. This is the strongest force, which gives water some really cool properties. Okay? What's the weakest, you think? If hydrogen bonding is the strongest, dispersion is the weakest, and then dipole-dipole is going to fall in between those. Okay? How many... Uh, hydrogen bonds, could this water molecule form with another water molecule? Okay, it's actually four. Do y'all see that it's four? What was the question? How many hydrogen bonds can this water molecule form with another water molecule? Y'all, hydrogen bonds a lot of time are shown by drawing a bunch of these little things, okay? They're not drawn by showing bonds like this. We draw a bunch of those and it shows hydrogen bonding. Do you see that this hydrogen can hydrogen bond with a lone pair on another water molecule? This hydrogen can hydrogen bond with a lone pair on another water molecule, right? This lone pair can hydrogen bond with a hydrogen on another water molecule. Right? And this one can hydrogen bond with a hydrogen. So water, a single water molecule, has the capability of forming four other hydrogen bonds. Every component of a water molecule, the lone pairs and the hydrogens, they would all be involved in the hydrogen bonding. That gives water a lot of unique properties. Okay? It's related to why... Um, 
why water has a high surface tension, which we're going to talk about in a minute. Why H2O actually has a relatively high boiling point compared to other things in its group, because look, here's oxygen. Sulfur's right here on the periodic table, okay? If hydrogen combines with oxygen, it makes water, which we know is a liquid at room temperature. If hydrogen and sulfur combine, it forms hydrogen sulfide, which is a gas. Could hydrogen sulfide molecules, H2S, could they hydrogen bond with each other? Looks a lot like a water molecule, except I've replaced the O with an S. Could it hydrogen bond with another hydrogen sulfide? No. Why not? Because the hydrogen is not bonded to NO or S. It's not bonded to an electronegative atom, so it cannot hydrogen bond. Okay? Therefore, H2S is a gas at room temperature and water is a liquid. And yet, they're, just, they're not that different in the, where they show up on the periodic table. Okay?